right, of course. Hello, everyone. I welcome you back to our next session. Um, this session is about debugging applications and networking in Riot. We have three very, very hopefully nice presentations in this session. And I'd say we go right to it. The first presentation comes from Richard Koopman. He is uh, working at Lauterbach and he has been a long time embedded engineer with a lot of experience. Um, he recently built Rise Awareness into uh, the Lauterbach um, product. And he will present us now how to debug Riot with the Trace32 Lauterbach debugger. Richard, are you there? Richard, we can't hear you so far. Are you saying anything? Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Good, although I've been an engineer for 33 years, I still struggle with the basics sometimes. Let's try. So we saw your slide earlier. But now it's ah, now it's popping up again. And hopefully you can see my first slide now. Yes, yes. we can see it. Great. First off, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I've quite enjoyed working with Riot OS, and presenting technology like this is something that I consider a very enjoyable part of my job. I've been working with real-time and embedded systems for thirty-three years. 20 of those have been at Lauterbach. Um, the job has taken me all over the world, America, Canada, most of Europe, Israel, the Far East. Um, I've lectured for various groups of peoples and at various universities here in the UK. So University of East Anglia, University of Hull, Imperial College London, University of Southampton, University of Oxford. So I'm, I'm hoping some of that is, is gonna come through today. So today we're going to be talking, in fact, I'm going to be covering five things. I, why has it started animating? Okay. So we're going to cover who are allowed to back. So we're the largest manufacturer of debuggers worldwide or independent manufacturer of debuggers worldwide. The company was founded in 1979. And we're based in Hohenkirk and Siegertsbrunn, just outside of Munich. The company's privately owned by the founders. And we have approximately 120 employees worldwide with subsidiary offices in China, France, Italy, Japan, Tunisia, UK, and the USA. All of the other territories where we work, we have exclusive, highly technical distributors. Um, the bulk of our sales is on, on word of mouth and the technical expertise that we bring to it. So we need to make sure that even in the territories where we're not working directly, we have somebody that can, can deal with the support. So Lauterbach is different because the company is privately owned and engineering led. Um, we're not chasing quarterly results. We're not following fads for the industry this month that were being led by shareholders. Um, we have a plan, we know where we're going, we stick to it, we have a lot of um, close cooperation with the silicon vendors, so we know their roadmaps and we know what, what devices are coming. 80% of the staff worldwide are engineers, everybody else is sort of admin type staff. All of the R&D, engineering and production takes place in our facility just outside of Munich. Um, we have an excellent reputation for, for providing timely, high quality support. In fact, even Mr. Lauterbach himself will still answer support calls from time to time. So if it's something that he developed uh, when he was working as an engineer in the company, he will take the support calls on it. And we only make debug tools. We don't make anything else, so there's no dilution of effort. Because we only make debuggers, we have to be agnostic. We need to work with all the compilers and RTOSs and third party tools that are available. So we, we have a, a fairly open API, um, which allows us to work with a lot of other tools. So we're only one part of the tool chain. And as I said, we have lots of long term close relationships with silicon vendors. 
So an overview of the tools. Um, the whole philosophy is they're, they're modular. And designed. One, one second, we still see only the second slide. Um, I'm not sure whether it's on purpose or a mistake. Um, oh, okay. Now it's been running along. So let's try again. Um, okay, how have we got this far yet? I've... Now we see your first slide, yeah. Who, who are Lauterbach? Okay, um, so these are the four things I'm going to cover today. Um, we've talked about who Lauterbach are. Sorry if the slides have got out of sequence with my voice. Um, why we think we're different from a lot of our competitors. And now we're into the, the overview of the tools. So the tools are designed to be modular and grow with you. So you'll start with a generic base module. Um, and not that I'd recommend it, but if you were to pop the lid off there and have a look inside, there's um, the current generation have a large 64-bit PowerPC processor, some scratch memory, and five or six big FPGAs. So you then have the option of USB 3 or USB 3 and gigabit Ethernet to the host. And the box is just um, a dumb box until you add the personality cable, which looks like that. And the personality cable says it's going to be an ARM or a RISC-V or a PowerPC or, or something. And you plug the cable in, you start the software, it connects to the box, it reads the license from the cable and says, oh, we're Cortex-M today. And then we reprogram all of the FPGAs inside the box. So it now becomes a Cortex M debugger. Um, and putting it together, it looks looks like that. So that's what a basic set of tools will look like. And then we have a couple of um, lower end combined JTAG and trace tools. So these will be aimed at probably the same sort of area that, that Riot OS is aimed at. So we've got Cortex M. Um, the risk five, some of the, um, the tri-core devices will be covered by these. So it, it's where you've got a, a low bandwidth trace port. So you can have the, the JTAG and the trace signals coming out and stored in these slightly smaller units here. So if we take the base unit, we can add to that, um, a trace module. Again, that's just another box full of FPGAs with a lot of RAM in it. Uh, it comes in one, two, four, and eight gigabytes. And then you have a CPU specific trace preprocessor. So this is the bit that plugs into the target and does the initial decoding of the off chip trace stream, which is then stored in the, the buffer unit. Um, so that's what a, a complete system will look like. If the eight gigabytes in the box, aren't sufficient for you. You can stream the trace information up through the USB to the host computer, and then you can record for as long as you've got hard drive space to hold the trace information. So these would be typically aimed at um, people that are manufacturing mobile handsets or set-top boxes, um, tablets, servers, anything that's sort of at a high-end automotive would use these as well. They're, they're much more high end than where we would see Riot OS typically going. So you may come across these, but I don't think it likely. But as we said, the tools are designed to grow with you. And as you move from one project to a next, the two universal base modules will stay the same and you swap the debug cable and the preprocessor for the architecture that you're using in the new project. And then we have a sequence of a series of logic analyzers that, that plug in. So if you, there's a common bus that runs through all of our tools, so you can plug them together. Um, and we have numerous logic analyzers. So you can start to sample software trace and hardware events side by side, and you can use the two to cross trigger each other. So I can hook one of those up to um, a RAM bus, say, and then I can start sampling it when a particular event happens in software, or if I see a particular pattern on the bus, I can then 
break the software or start tracing the software or something. There's a, there's a cross trigger between hardware and software, which can be useful sometimes. As the introductor said, um, I wrote the original Riot OS kernel awareness for Trace32, and I'm currently in the process of updating it for the latest release. Um, what is a kernel awareness? It's an extension to the Trace32 debugger. We currently support about 80 different RTOSs. They're all provided free of charge. They're included on the software DVD or in the image that you download, whichever way you get your software. All of the operating system awarenesses are included in those. They're loaded at runtime dynamically into the debugger. Um, they typically consist of two files. There's the kernel awareness plugin, and then a menu file, which gives you access to some of the extra features that it adds. On some of the more complex operating systems, uh, say an embedded Linux or an embedded Windows, there may be some additional scripts that we provide to simplify some very complex operations. Um, with something like Riot OS or FreeRTOS or ThreadX, some of the, the smaller hard real-time execs, you typically don't have those because there aren't a sequence of complex operations to load things into virtual memory or virtual machines or anything like that. So it's it's quite simple. And the kernel awareness provides access to RTOS resources at runtime. So it'll display system objects, tasks, threads, semaphores, mailboxes, mutex, whatever the operating system provides, there'll be a window that shows you a view of all of those kernel level objects. You can set task aware breakpoints which is useful if you're debugging a shared library or shared code where you want to break when a particular thread is executing that code, but not if any of the other threads are calling into it. We can do some task aware performance monitoring, and we can do that either through the standard JTAG debug interface, or if you want much more accurate timing, we can use the, the off-chip or the on-chip trace information that's generated by the processor core. Then the awareness may be built by us. It might be built by one of our customers, or it might be built by the RTOS developer. Um, somebody will will build it and then provide it to the people that are using the OS. So the process of building the plugin first requires that you have our extension development kit um, or EDK. It's free of charge, but we need you to sign an NDA because we have some proprietary information in there that we'd like to keep a little bit under wraps. You can use a Windows or a Linux build host. Uh, and in fact, a Riot OS, I used Fedora Core 31, and, and that worked quite nicely. Inside the EDK, there are some C library routines, example make files. There's a custom embedded C cross compiler, documentation and examples. When you get the EDK, it will come with at least two examples. One of them will be embedded Linux, and one of them will be another operating system, the one that we believe is closest to the one that you will be developing the kernel awareness for. So if you're doing something, a hard little exec, there's no point giving you an embedded Windows example. We'll give you something like free RTOS or micro COS something that that's quite close so that it's easier to take that as a starting point and adapt it so the build process is it's quite simple take the existing example and modify it um, it's much much easier than starting from scratch the environment is already configured the make file is already there and there are skeleton functions provided for most of the operating system objects that you'll likely want to provide support for. There's a few mandatory functions that you need to provide. So you need to tell us about the currently executing task or thread. We need to know where to find that information. You need to be able to provide us with a list of all tasks or threads, whether they're running or not. And you need to provide a function that deals with stacking and unstacking registers that's compatible with the operating system when it performs a context switch. 
um, and that allows the debugger then to arbitrarily switch context between any task or thread on the system so that when you've hit a breakpoint, you can view everything else just by switching the context. Everything else is optional. If you want to provide support for semaphores, take our skeleton, modify it for the operating system, add the semaphore support into the make file. Um, in the main kernel OS or the awareness file, you'll add a new command that says semaphores are supported. You'll add a new function for the semaphores. Um, and then you can do anything else that you think is going to make life easier for your users. So you're not just limited to the, the standard operating system constructs. Yes, a list of tasks. Yes, a list of timers. Yes, a list of mailboxes. But anything else that you think your users that might help them, you can build that into the awareness as well. Um, we've got one that was done by the Artos designer, and he uses a lot of ring buffers. So he has a particular view added into his kernel awareness that allows you to interrogate all of the ring buffers and, and walk down down the chain and things. So what do we need in order to create a kernel awareness? Um, header and source files for the operating system are really, really helpful. In some cases, we can get away with the documentation and a kernel that's been compiled with the debug information. So we've got the documentation that tells us how things are laid, laid out internally, and then we've got a, a known example that we can test against. Riot OS is provided in source, and, and I was quite impressed. The header files and source files are very well documented. Uh, it was very easy to extract the information from there to put the awareness together. And I found the community to be very good as well. There are a couple of times I got stuck on something and I went and posted something on the forum. And within an hour, I had two or three answers back saying, try this or look at this or read this. Um, and I was able to get back up and running again quite quickly. A working build environment is really good because we need to create example applications to test the awareness against. So you provide a, a number of it, examples that you can build and they will all have tasks in them, but they won't all have all of the other objects in. So we'll need to build two or three test cases to make sure that all of the things we've included in the awareness are functioning correctly. A lot of this can be done in the Trace32 instruction set simulator. So you don't need, often you don't need hardware um, to test it on, especially for something like the Cortex-M. Um, we've got a very good simulated environment for that. We simulate the, the NVIC and a lot of other um, peripherals. So you can get a, a good feel for, for loading the operating system and, and getting it running in the simulated environment to see how things are working and then make sure that the awareness is pulling out the right information. At the end of the day, there's no subject for testing it on real hardware with real tools. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes now to show you some some screenshots, basically, and talk you through what what's going on. So the awareness, when you've built it, you provide a menu. All of the menus in our user interface are completely customizable. So you can add them, subtract them, replace them. And all you're doing with the operating system awareness is just adding another sub menu to it. That's loaded after the awareness plugin has been loaded and it just provides access to many of the, the operating system objects very quickly and easily for the user. So the first one will be to display a list of tasks or threads within the system. Um, so you can see the columns that I've picked out there. I'm running from left to right now. Magic, that's um, a unique identifier within the debugger that refers to a particular task or thread. It's normally the address of the pointer to the task control block, but it doesn't always have to be. Process ID, a name if it's supported, the state of the task or thread, and then it's priority. Everywhere you see a magic column in any window, 
there's a hidden right click menu behind that that will give you access to further information about that item so in this case a task or a thread so you can provide detailed information which gives you a more detailed view other than what appears in the list you can look at the task structure um, you can look at the stack frame so the, the call stack we can switch context to that particular task um, so there's a, a lot of extra information hidden on that right click menu so for system objects i've added timers and ring buffers mailboxes mutexes and semaphores um, if there's something that i haven't included that you would like to see in the awareness please drop me an email it's 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 feedback from from users like yourselves that help us to to make a better awareness which is more useful to you in the long run so it allows us to improve the product i've i've picked out the things that i think are essential but i'm not using riot os on a day-to-day -day basis um, i have to cover dozens of different artoses that are used um, across my customer base so i'm not i'm not deep in the trenches as it were so you will have a better idea of what's helpful for you and by providing me with that feedback hopefully i can make a kernel awareness that helps you to get your job done more quickly so at the bottom of the debugger software window in the status bar there will be um, an entry a field with the currently executing task or thread and there's a left click menu on there that pops up a menu with all of the others and just selecting one from there will force a context switch to that task or thread and any open windows would also switch to show the values of that newly switched in task or thread so any local variables the registers the stack frame where the program counter is sitting within the code all of that will change as you switch the context from one task to another and then we can dump the stack usage for each thread so you can look at the the current position of the stack pointer the size of the stack frame um, the historical maximum amount that's been used so you can sort of set a high watermark um, and in the example i've seen there i could probably half the size of all of my stacks because even the, the top one is only approaching about 40% usage. Normally with these things, actually Riot OS was, was quite unique. This intrigued me. Um, most other operating systems that I've done an awareness for, when you allocate the stack, they pre-fill it with a default value, normally A5 or EE or something. Um, but Riot o OS, you put the address of that memory location in as the value for that memory location when you you pre-filled the stack so that intrigued me that was quite interesting i'll just mention that sorry um again you can look at the, the call stack so i can see exactly where i am in in relation to that particular task or thread so i can see this function was called from this one which was called from this one um arguments are listed local variables are listed with their current values and in the the drop down on the right i can switch the context to any other task or thread on the system and i will see the call stack for that one so, task aware breakpoints um, it just populates the task drop down in the breakpoint setting window so i can specify a, a breakpoint a break on access to an instruction or a break on read or write of a memory location and then say but i only want that to trigger when task in this case pong is active so we can do some some statistical profiling over the jtag interface um, if the cpu provides a non-intrusive way of accessing the the memory um, the cortex m does some of the risk fives do um, automotive power pcs do I think RH850 does, but a lot of them have it. It's a nice feature to have, um, but it means we can read the currently executing task or thread ID at runtime and then use it to populate the graph so you can see where your code is spending most of its time. So the example I've 
chosen here I took from a Cortex M and the runtime is at 100% because the Cortex M allows me to snoop the memory at runtime without interrupting the, the application being executed. If the target processor doesn't have that, we, we fall back to a stop and go method. Um, so we halt the processor, read the memory, start the processor running again and update the chart. So when we do that, there will be a level of intrusion and we calculate that and put it in the runtime. We try and adjust the sampling point or sampling frequency so that we're no more than 5% intrusive. But again, that depends on the target processor and the connection interface that we've got and how quickly it responds to a halt, read, restart sequence. Um, so it may be slightly more. And we also randomize the sampling frequency. So we don't always sample every 10 milliseconds because if you had a 10 millisecond event, we would either always hit it or never see it. So by randomizing the sampling point, we avoid those repeated events and hopefully we'll catch those very, very random events simply by it being random and us randomizing the timing sequence when we, we take the sample. If you want more information or more detailed information, um, you'd need to have a processor with a trace port on it and then we can sample that right down to sort of nanosecond accuracy. So again, I've got the, the same display at the top, but it's much more accurate. And then in the bottom window, I can see how the tasks or threads have switched over time. Um, and you can zoom that in and out. You can drag a bar to time between A and B. Or if you wanted much more detailed information, um, you can get a view like this. So running across the columns from left to right there's a record number there's an address that's the address of the variable that holds the currently executing task or thread id the cycle is a 32-bit write that's because the thread id was 32 bits and the operating system did a write to that when it did the context switch and then the next value is data that will be the magic which ties up to the magic values in the task list window and then the ti.back and ti.4 columns give me the time since the last task switch and the time to the next task switch. Um, I can search that, I can chart that, I can graph that, I can export it as a CSV file, I can export it into a whole bunch of industry standard timing tools so that you can really pull it apart and analyze worst case timing, best case timing. If you've got something on a continual, um, say a 10 millisecond event, you can actually isolate that out and look at the jitter that you have around those 10 milliseconds. Uh, it might be that sometimes it's a little bit late because you've got a very, very high priority interrupt that's taking too long and you're missing the event slightly. So, but all of that information is there. It's up to you how you want to analyze it. And finally, thank you very much for your time. I hope something in there has been useful or has at least got you thinking, ah, that, that's good, or maybe we can do something with that. Um, if you have any questions, and we've got a little bit of time, speak up now. If not, if you want to ping me with an email afterwards with a question or a comment or a suggestion, please, I'm, I'm happy to, to take those. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Um, we already have one question from Michael Richardson. Um, the question is, will you uh, will use of Rust or link time optimization be a problem for your system? Um, no, we've done we've done some work with with Rust. So we have um, the, the debugger itself is Rust aware. So we support C, C++, Rust, Ada, Pascal, Fortran, Java, eight there's an eighth one i can never remember the last it's something that probably nobody still alive uses um maybe COBOL or algol or something i don't know there is an eighth one and i i can never remember it um so those are the high level languages that we support most of the information comes from the symbol file so when you build the application with debug information um it contains a, a map of addresses to source lines 
So we look at where the program counter is and that says, oh, it's in file main.c line 27. So we take a copy of main.c, we put it in the temporary directory. So somebody else is then free to work on it and we don't end up showing you their current changes. Um, and then we highlight line 27, mark that as where the program counter is. And so you will see the source code from there. It's just mapped to the, the information in the debug file. Right. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I have a question for you. Uh, this is not too technical though. Um, I mean, the solution is very promising and I think it would help many Riot developers to, to debug their stuff uh, better and faster and get a better feeling of what they're doing. But I guess as a kind of private hobbyist, it's quite out of scope to get one of your units, right? So do you see any way that kind of a Riot developer and a small company can get access to your tools? Um, the the low-cost combined JTAG and Trace units that we have uh, are about half the price of our standard JTAG tools. So we, we recognize there is a, a, a big hobbyist community out there and we've got a, a low-cost tool for that. Um, for people running with the, the Arduino boards, they have a, a GDB server that you can include in the application image. And we can connect to that via a serial port or a network port. So if you have a, a GDB server, then you can um, get the tools to connect to that. And I think that that then only is the, the, the software front end license, which means you don't have to then buy the hardware. So that, that's another cheaper option. For um, academics and for universities, we have a, a university program where we can provide a number of those licenses at a significant discount, sometimes even free of charge. Um, you'd have to go and speak to our global head of sales. He handles that. Um, he's in Munich and he's quite an approachable guy. But you can get a, a lab kitted out with a set of um, the low end tools or the software debuggers. So at least you've got, you know, hands on experience with it before you get out into industry and have to use it for real on a, on a bigger project. I, All I, right. I know it's not the answer you were hoping for, but I, it, <laughs> no, it is, it is it just to, to get a feeling expressing your concerns. Yeah, yeah. Not my personal, but I think many people like me looking at this the same way. And, and when you're a little bit in this business, um, you basically grow up and people always say, you, yeah, Lauterbach, that's the top end, but it's unreachable for most. So it's good to hear that there's actually approachable approaches for, for people to, to get into this. Yeah, we're, we're very keen on supporting universities because these are our next generation of engineers. They're going to be coming out and designing and building the products that we all use and will take for granted next year. So we, we would like right. to get their hands on Lauterbach equipment as early as possible. All right. So thank you very much for your interesting talk again. Okay. No, thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. So then uh, we will proceed to our next talk. Um, our next talk is uh, by Tobias Buchberger and Ines Kramer from FI Vienna. Um, they are both researchers for IT security at the um, FIH campus Wien. And they um, have both been working there for uh, some time um, with a focus on security and IoT systems in particular.